Let's go to the beach, the shore. For the next hour, we're going to take a seaside vacation. We'll do some expected things. Build a sand castle, bounce in the waves. We'll put up an umbrella and just relax. We'll talk to lifeguards in Rehoboth, Delaware, and go people watching in Venice, California. We'll eat some seafood, get some saltwater taffy, mosey along the boardwalk, and consider retiring at the beach, among other things. We'll meet Stephen Leatherman, who's known as Dr. Beach. We'll try to catch some fish everywhere from the Outer Banks to Hawaii. And we'll talk with many people about their theories of why we humans come to the water's edge. I think it just seems to succeed. We're going to call this program Shore Things. It's a silly sort of pun, but a title that lets us include a lot of different subjects. Shore Things is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Let's start early on a July morning at Daytona Beach Shores in Florida. This time of day, the elemental attractions of the beach are obvious. The sun, the water, the sand. The first people on the beach every morning are walkers and runners. Later, people will come with beach equipment, chairs, toys, umbrellas, sure things. You can haul all that yourself, or if you're lucky enough to be near this stretch of beach, you can rent it from Roy Marin and his wife, Diane Paquin, who bring this magical looking trailer onto the beach every morning. In the summer, we come in early because usually by 8 o'clock, I already have customers coming in, either by car or from the motels. So we like to be ready. I don't like to rush in the morning, you know, rush because everybody's waiting for me. And, you know, and so we also like to, uh, to set up before it's too hot. Yes. It's kind of um, a teamwork between me and the wife, and uh, we kind of pick out what we have to do. We spend a lot of time together setting up and looking after customers. If you want to expect the customer to rent the merchandise, it has to be clean. And this is part of the reason why we choose that style of chair, which is easy to keep clean. And it's also part of the best service on the beach. It is. Sure. Roy and Diane are from Montreal. They bought this beach concession in the early 90s as a retirement business. Back then, the trailer was a lot smaller, but it was already painted bright blue and orange, the colors of the gators of the University of Florida. People were telling me, go gator, go gator. I didn't know what it was for until I found out those were the colors of the gators. So, so they subsequently bought a new trailer, and Roy customized it himself. I was thinking of two different things, which was a very big uh, Indian tent and also a carousel. And make sure that I get enough American flags there so that everybody can see it. On a good day, Roy and Diane will set up 20 umbrellas and tables at the water's edge. They do take reservations. We got a lot of first-timers on here. They don't even know that the tide comes in. So what we'll do every day is we'll move with the tide. Like we have set the customer up there as far as we could, but as soon as the tide goes down, then we'll move them down with the tide. We do that all day. I have the ocean in my backyard, and I can use it whenever I want to. What I like about the job is when my day is over, it's over. Two hours in the day. Every and I mean every customer we get here are on vacation. They do not think of insecurity at work. They do not think of bills, hydro bills, water bills. They are here on vacation. They all have a smile. And that's nice to work with people with a smile. Roy and Diane park their trailer here at Daytona Beach Shores, which is just south of Daytona proper. All of that's on this narrow strip of land that has 23 miles of uninterrupted beach in northeastern Florida. Daytona likes to call itself the world's most famous beach, and it's a beauty. 
was a wide band of hard packed sand that you're allowed to drive on. I like the driving on the beach, uh, mainly because it's, it's just so much of a tradition and it does bring a lot of visitors and tourism to the beach area. Vehicles on the sand do make Daytona very unusual and a lot of fun. The cars, they've been here for, you know, almost as long as the people have been here on the beach. They started racing on the beach, they, they kept driving on the beach. The racing was in the early 20th century, and Daytona Beach was a favorite of speedsters who set many auto racing speed records here. Now there's a 10 mile per hour speed limit. When I moved down here 12 years ago, we could drive on the beach 24 hours a day, and there was no toll charges at all. Now they've limited it to daylight driving, and they do charge a fee, which helps pay for the maintenance of the beach. This is Kerry Vagnier and his friend Carolyn Courtmanche. They rent beach paraphernalia too, that's several miles north of Roy and Diane. Carolyn's from Canada and first came here to visit relatives. I met him on the beach, so I kind of fell in love at the same time, so that's why I came back. Carrie's from Columbus, Ohio, and never came to the shore until he was 24. I can remember the first time I saw the beach in the ocean, I was just, you know, it just like swept me off my feet. And I told myself I could never ever leave again. It, to me, it's the most beautiful place in the world that God made. Um, I mean, you look out there, there's nothing like it in the world. And not everybody has this to enjoy right in their own backyard like we do. And it's just like one big family swimming pool. Actually, we Americans are fortunate to have two giant swimming pools, one on each side of North America. And people who've been to beaches on both coasts love to compare them. We met Mary Martin from Novato, California, there in Daytona. Well, the California beaches, where I live, the waves are bigger, but the water temperature is so cold, you really can't get out there and enjoy it like, like here. And the air temperature is cooler, too. But I enjoy both, so I come out here during the summer and stay for a couple months, and then go back and uh, do California again. When you start comparing American beaches, you won't go far before someone points you towards the University of Maryland at College Park, where Dr. Stephen Leatherman teaches. Known as Dr. Beach, he puts out an annual list of the top 10 beaches in the United States. He also does extensive research and studying of beach erosion. Locally, people call me a beachologist. Um, my professional title is really coastal geomorphologist. That doesn't seem to go down very well. Even the press calls me a coastal geologist, which is fairly close. His list has been printed in Condé Nast Traveler magazine, and his picks tend to reflect his preference for beaches where you can swim safely and find some escape. And I like to go to beaches really to get away from people. I don't go there to party so much as to go back and start decompressing you know, from the urban life. He admits his first list was just off the top of his head one day. He'll say, well, what are your criteria? Oh, uh, criteria? Oh, my goodness, people are really taking this seriously. That was in 1989. And so then it took me two years, really, to, uh, well, I worked up to 50 criteria and then to do the sampling of the 650 public recreational beaches in the United States. And ever since, everybody's always interested, interested to see who's on the radio and who isn't. In 1995, St. Andrews State Recreational Area near Panama City, Florida, was number one on Dr. Leatherman's list. Well, we look at uh, sand size, sand color, sand softness, water clarity, uh, size of breaking waves, whether or not they're dangerous rip currents or not, uh, biological factors like are there nice birds but no insects, jellyfish wa washing up, that's obviously a negative, a no-no. Some beaches are in our opinion are way overdeveloped. You got high rises uh, you know, right up against the, the water line, the beach has no place to go. Uh, so we score everything, one to five, 50 criteria, uh, 250 possible total score, no beach is totally perfect, at least in our estimation. But there's some really great ones. Few West Coast beaches ever make Dr. Leatherman's list, but there's no place on the East Coast that's quite like Venice, California. It's unique, not because of the beach itself, which is pretty nice, but because of a combination of things, the whole scene, 
the biking and roller skating path, and the boardwalk. You don't come here to get away from it all. People come to Venice to see the circus. It's sort of almost like a freak show down on the beach. There's all kinds of weird people that come from all over the United States. Some to be seen, some to play their fantasy. They uh, come to watch the entertainments down here. Welcome to Venice. Actually, there's a lot of chaos that goes on here, but through time, it's been a place that the people have associated with enjoyment. People still come, even though there's madness going on. All right, now, you speak English? Me too, no problem. <laughs> Take your shoes off. No, no, no. <laughs> You just can't help but be happy when you're in the sun and you're near the water and you've got all that warm sand out there and everybody's happy and, we, and, and all the um, people get freaky and weird and entertain each other and it just, you know, it's like a big party. This is definitely the showcase. Everyone comes out here, it's like a fashion show or you have a party, you have a nice looking physique, people like to walk around with the shirts off, you know, L.A., Hollywood style. Walking the boardwalk at Venice is a show. Everyone is a street performer. Ladies and gentlemen from Scotland, let's hear from Mr. Kentucky Fried Chicken Legs. Right on. Alright. You know the guy with the turban and the electric guitar? He's the Venice icon, Harry Perry. The world's most famous street musician. <laughs> it's me, da 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 da. He wants people to come to Venice. To get the Harry Perry's t-shirt, of course. <laughs> Dun -da -da -da. <laughs> Weekends are wildest. That's when the most people come to see and be seen. It feels like a bazaar. The shops are on one side of what's called Oceanfront Walk. And on the side toward the ocean, there are performers, fortune tellers. Yeah, this is our belief. <laughs> Even a sand sculptress with her model. I started this about an hour ago. It takes usually about four or five hours to finish it. Sometimes if it's really good, they ask, is there someone under that? And uh, I, don't, I was going to kick out of that. That way I know I've got a good sculpture, you know? So, and it's really beautiful out here. You meet the most interesting people of every nationality. That's probably the best thing about it. You take a picture, leave a donation, okay? That's how I make my living. And there's so many tourists in Venice that um, I get like a dollar for every picture and I and usually end up making enough for my rent and everything, you know. Well, what I do is I take these tourist people that have never been on that surf out there and I create their own little reality. Taking a photo, it makes it look like they're surfing. Oh, is that oh, let's do So I'm trying to get myself in shape. I come down here every day around four, and we uh, play three-man basketball for about two or three hours or so. So I'm a look. I grew up in Malibu, and uh, you know, all my friends live down here, so I used to come down to Venice and play. Pat from Marina del Rey often bikes past or through Venice. It's the bike route. From Santa Monica, it goes all the way down the coast, through all the beaches, down as far as Palsburg. Long stretch. There's also a small building with a fenced-in area beside it, known as Muscle Beach. Why does Breon Burke come here? I'm a truly an exhibitionist, and I like to work out, and it makes you work a little harder, I think. I get a little bit from it. If people expect something from me, then I command the performance I need. So, whether that be fitness or academics or anything, but I say, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. And if you're going to skate, skate in Venice. Venice, for a while, was known as the roller skating capital of America. 
a roller skating boom began in the late 70s. It was perfect. They had just invented the polyurethane wheels. Uh, you could skate anywhere, and Venice had lots of flat surfaces, a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt. Jeffrey Stanton is a local historian, writer, photographer, and he owns a postcard company. With tourists very reluctant to part with their dollars, sometimes the only thing they buy are postcards. Mine are only a quarter, so it's not a big investment. This rack's mine. Well, actually, my favorite card's always been this one of the fire blower, just because of the intricate lighting. Jeffrey has also written a history book titled Venice, California, Coney Island of the Pacific. He took us behind the boardwalk to see some of the old canals. This is uh, basically what all that remains of historic Venice. Building this resort just west of Los Angeles was the idea of a tobacco millionaire named Abbott Kinney in the early 1900s. Venice had its grand opening on July 4th, uh, 1905, complete with a series of canals. Uh, business district that looked like the Plaza San Marco in Venice, Italy. The whole place here was supposed to be like Venice, Italy. You can see some of the old arched colonnades and architectural details in the center of town. Well, Venice was a, a very thriving resort, uh, especially in the, in the teens and 20s. Uh, their small piers were converted into huge amusement piers with roller coasters and fun houses and, and uh, a zillion rides. Much of Venice's old brightness faded when the town became part of L.A. in 1925. For Los Angeles, it was, it was like annexing Disneyland. One of the first things they did was began closing things down. Most of the canal networks were filled in in 1929. Jeffrey the historian wishes Venice were more like it used to be, but seems to appreciate its unusual charm. Venice has always attracted a, a very independent-minded group of people. People that were a little bit different than everywhere else. I, I'm not quite sure why this has occurred, but this one section of beach has always done that. Only one Venice people. Only one. Only one. Venice over there in Italy, that ain't nothing. Come to Venice Beach, California. <laughs> Many coastal cities have a boardwalk, not always as wild as the one here in Venice, but a wide sort of super sidewalk. They're called boardwalks because the first ones were made of wooden boards. And Atlantic City, New Jersey claims to have built the first one, or the first major one, in 1870. Originally designed as a way to prevent people from bringing so much sand into the hotels, the boardwalk became a prime business location, as well as the most expensive property on the Monopoly board. There are some really nice boardwalks along the Jersey Shore. I think Ocean City has the nicest boardwalk in New Jersey, and possibly in America. It still has some of the old flavor. We certainly have our t-shirt shops, but we still maintain some of the higher quality shops. And we haven't had to do something so drastic as put gambling in to revive our, our community. We've always been a stable, long-lasting beach resort community. Hank Glazer and his sister Ginny own the saltwater taffy place called Shrivers on the boardwalk in Ocean City, New Jersey. At the back of their shop, there's a window where you can watch part of the production process. It's an old tradition here. Shrivers has been here on the boardwalk since 1898. And this door was built by 1929. And they made their taffy in the basement and ran on smaller machines in the window. Obviously, they didn't do the business that we do now. We make over, just in this one store, over 100,000 pounds in, a, in the course of the summer. It's a very simple candy to make. It's mostly sugar and corn syrup. We cook it in a steam jacketed kettle. It's a hundred pound batch. We then drop it down into a vacuum kettle. The second step is generally laying it out on the table, getting it cool to the right consistency where you can pull it. 
one thing you have to do with saltwater tapping is you have to stretch it. The pulling process is where we flavor it and color it. The biggest myth people have about saltwater tapping is they think that we go out into the ocean and get salt water and put it in. They really think there's salt water in it when in fact there's no salt in it and very little water. The story is that a taffy vendor in Atlantic City in the 1880s once left his candy out overnight and it got splashed. He jokingly referred to it as saltwater taffy and the name just stuck. A lot of people think the stripe on the taffy contains the flavor. It doesn't. All it is is an unpulled piece of saltwater taffy which we've just colored very strongly then we lay it on the taffy just so we know what flavor taffy it is. The banana has an orange stripe. If we didn't put the orange stripe on it, we'd think it was lemon. And that's the only reason why you have stripes on taffy. A 100 pound batch makes between 4,500 and 5,000 pieces of taffy. This machine cuts and wraps each piece in two sheets of wax paper, twists the ends and shoots the product out. You can also watch the finished taffy being packed into boxes by Vera Mae Chimino and her crew, see what I have to do. who work just behind the cutting and wrapping machine. Without us hidden behind the glass case, there is no stripes. So the old girls can pack 61 pound boxes in 20 minutes. And then I do the two pounders and the three pounders and the marriages. A marriage is a two pound box. single, saltwater taffy is just a classic sure thing. If you're in Ocean City, New Jersey, you may also want to stop by the little shop called George's for the famous macaroons there. And hope that you don't end up eating too much stuff as you walk along the boardwalk. Ocean City, New Jersey has always had a lot of activities along the boardwalk. This was the 1933 Baby Parade. City was one of several towns along the Jersey Shore that were founded by church groups in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Some people wanted an alternative to wild and boozy Atlantic City just to the north. The big thing which makes us different from other places is we have no liquor. This is a completely dry town and it's the only dry town on the Jersey coast that has a boardwalk and amusements. Okay, so the dry ocean city is here on the Jersey Shore, and it's not to be confused with the other wet ocean city down here on the Maryland coast. Ocean City, Maryland also has a busy boardwalk. You can eat lots of stuff here, too. You can fly a kite, ride the boardwalk train, and get a drink if you'd like. As in all beach towns, people come here for all sorts of reasons. Go to the beach, you swim, you ride the waves, and you do crabs later. <laughs> and you have a very good time, and and we catch about we catch a lot of um, crabs yesterday. Total relaxation. You can lie down on the beach, the waves are crashing in on you. You just lie there in the sand and it's hot and you just, just chill it all together, you know? Just go fast. Just sometimes sometimes ride the waves. Sometimes use movie boards to surf in all the way. I'm glad. It's on the beach. You're going to rise mostly. Mostly. People usually come here on vacation. Because this is a vacation. Vacation. Because we came here from North Carolina. Yeah. And it's a good time to enjoy yourself. And just Peaceful and it's tranquil, the waves crashing. It's also kind of romantic. You see it in the movies, and you know, you want to come and experience it for yourself. I don't normally do walk around basically in my underwear in public, more or less. People just come like to hang out, you know, and like have a good time because it's, it's cool, you know. And I don't know, you can party here. And some people come to the beach to find money. The man down at the water's edge is Bill Collins, who lives here in Ocean City, Maryland. I've been coming here since 1918, I guess, when I was born. 
still comes out here regularly for good reasons. Fresh air, sunshine, exercise. And since he brings his metal detector along, there's always the possibility of buried treasure. The best night I've had so far this year, I picked up $11.79. June is not the best month. That's because of what they call the June bugs. All the high school kids get out, come down here, and they don't know what they're doing with their money. I, I think they throw the pennies away. I found 84 pennies one night. Bill doesn't listen to the roar of the waves out here. He's listening for the tone that tells him where the metal is. Nickels don't sound off as loud as other coins, but uh, a lot of times you can't tell the difference between a quarter and a penny. So how long has Bill Collins been doing this? The first time I ever used one of these was in France, World War II, <laughs> a minefield. About 1968 or 69, I started. What's the best thing you ever found? My wife. <laughs> okay, good answer. Bill's also got a theory about why we humans come to the beach. I guess we came out of the sea, probably. <laughs> Earliest beginning. Like lemmings, we, we go back to the ocean. Well, no matter where we come from, there are still a lot of creatures in the ocean, and many people go to the shore to try to catch some. We come here special to fish. Special, not no bleaching. We can come to fish and catch fish. Mm -hmm. A lot of people go to the Outer Banks to fish. Hey, uh, the Outer Banks are out here, a series of long, narrow barrier islands off the coast of North Carolina. At the south end of the Bonner Bridge, you'll often find a motley group of fishermen and women on the west side of Hatteras Island. excited when you start catching a lot of fish, you just don't know when to go home? The ocean is nice too if you're out there fishing in the boat, but if you're not, right here see it. It's just, it's just nice. It's just pretty quiet. Just a little bit of everything. Croakers, spots, bluefish when they're jumping. Flounder, puppy drone, sheephead. This is a croaker. Because it croaks here. And a lot of times you can catch trout in here, you know, but this morning just hadn't been anything. I caught me a bottom rig that time. <laughs> it would be interested in something bigger, wouldn't it? <laughs> All of you home. and things, but right in here, it's just mostly fishing. That's what we like to do, so. We just enjoy fishing and eating fish after we catch them. And it's not just at this location. Out here, people fish from bridges, standing at the inlet, and if you stop by an Outer Banks fishing pier, you're sure to find more committed fishermen. You know what the best thing is? On the beach for me, is it? What? Fishing. A pier is like a boardwalk in the sky out over the waves. In some places, there are amusements on the piers, but this one's primarily for fishing. A lot of people call it Rodent. We call it Chicken Maconco. Okay? We are the furthest point east on the east coast. And it is North Carolina. And it's a great place to be, boss. That's all I can tell you. Well, out here you can see various techniques and kinds of equipment used to catch various kinds of fish. My dream fish. I think I'd like I'd like a nice king now. If I knew a nice king, my that would be nice, Captain. That would be nice. Now, if you catch one here, everybody gets a chance to see him. You know what I mean? So you don't tell me a lies here. <laughs> 
the goddamn truth. <laughs> if you're on the Outer Banks with the urge to fish and a four-wheel drive vehicle, you might want to consider heading out across the sand to the end of Cape Hatteras, where you can stand in the surf with all these other people. Well, actually, they're Spanish mackerel fishing, and they're casting lures. And uh, basically, that's the only type of fishing there is here at this time of year. Why would you bother to wade out to that sandbar? Well, to get an extra 20 or 30 feet on your cast, that's where you're going to catch them. That's why they fish there. It's worth it. This is the point. This is different than any beach on the East Coast. You had a lab door cart coming down from your left, and you had a golf stream coming down from your right. And this is the point. This is the edge of the earth on the East Coast. Okay, if people fish just about everywhere, you know what can happen when Hawaiian fishermen are zipping along near Punaloo Beach Park. As they're driving by, they see someone fishing right close to the shoreline, and they know llamas are running, and they grab their fishing poles, and they just rub shoulders and oohs and ahs when the next person catches an llama, and they keep trying. Right now, the llama is all in this area here. I came 4.30 this morning, about 5.30, I found the school. It's a little tiny delicacy. They're about the size of a sardine. And what do you do with a llama? You fry them crispy with uh, oil and Hawaiian salt, and they're good to eat. Fishing for these things is obviously a popular neighborhood activity. You have a lot of fun. Even the kids are enjoying it. See all them. Look at that little boy picking them up. <laughs> As you see, a lot of them will just come in with just so much. It's just enough for their family. Or you share it. And that's when you'll catch more. When you share it. Fish and various other sea creatures constitute another important reason for coming to the beach, seafood. In southern North Carolina, along what some people call the Brunswick Coast, there's a small town called Calabash. This town has no beach, no ocean. It's right on the Calabash River. Fishing boats and trawlers come in here loaded with fresh seafood. Because of the great seafood here, local people started cooking it and selling it, and Calabash became a town of restaurants. People started calling it the seafood capital of the world. Now there are a few other businesses, but all the restaurants like to brag that they were the first. The first and only, yeah. There's a couple of places down here that claim to be the original, and I'm not sure which is which, but I do know that we are one of the first. Well, this is uh, the first and only Calabash Seafood House. <laughs> of course, all these restaurants serve Calabash-style seafood. It's really simple fried seafood. We just roll in a batter of flour and milk, salt and pepper, and fry it. Fish and shrimp and crab and oysters and slow and french fries and hush puppies. Scallops if it's a deluxe plate. This is Ella High. Retired now, she opened her restaurant in 1950. Does she know the secret to Calabash success? No, ain't no secret. We just don't tell it all. <laughs> well, Ella has probably told it all to her daughter, Cheryl Ann Hardy, who runs the restaurant now. She knows the best thing on the menu. I would say the deluxe seafood, which has a little bit of everything on it. Everything is made back in the kitchen, where Verlene McRae is the cook. Does she know the secret? Hot grease. Hot grease is the secret. Gotta have a big fat fry. 350 degrees. And with the heat wave being as high as it's been the last three or four days, it's been real hot. It's like every breath you take is going to be the last one. 
you know, hate to know you have to breathe, but you got to breathe to live, right? <laughs> yeah, but you got to eat to live, too. And that's what keeps everybody busy here. We basically serve on a busy night right at 300 pounds per We have some people come in and say, um, well, my food tastes like this after so you must be more of these shrimp. We don't ever be more of shrimp. Because if you leave them under the light too long, they get tough. And you can't just do it. So we cook it fast as we get the orders to be constantly going, nonstop. Sometimes when I go to bed at night, I cook all night and go to sleep. <laughs> Especially a busy night. A busy night, you do, you know, you have a tendency of when you're waking up, you feel yourself still shaking the trail. <laughs> So what does the cook think is the best thing to order here? I don't know. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> All of it. You know, Ella herself was the first cook here. Does she think her restaurant is still the best place to eat in Calabash? Well, I'd be crazy not to say it was. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, fried seafood and goodies along the boardwalk can work against you at the beach, especially if you're concerned about how you look. But there's one group of men and women at the shore who set a good example in terms of fitness and looking pretty good in a bathing suit. Lifeguards. This rescue board relay race is being officiated by Jay Walsh, who's in charge of the beach patrols at Rehoboth, Delaware. Every morning, Monday through Friday, uh, we try to have some kind of activity for all the guards to take part in, kind of like a, uh, you know, just get together and compete a little bit type of drill. When this little drill is done, the first year lifeguards, the rookies, have to start some real exercise. Okay, let's go. For an hour and a half, they run, they swim, they work out. Veteran lifeguard Todd Fritchman is called a lieutenant, sort of a drill instructor. This is an initiation instructional type of workout that all rookies go through their first year. It's probably the hardest thing that an individual can do in any, any athletics, any athletic sports. The more seasoned lifeguards are already at work in their chairs and can watch the rookies work out. Sandy Copang doesn't feel sorry for these guys. Actually, I'd like to do it again. It was a lot of fun. Got you in really good shape, too. I, I was a rookie last year, and this is my second year. It's hard work, but it's fun. The rookies have to do this unusual leapfrogging exercise in the sand. It's a, an activity that involves every muscle in your body. It's, it serves no practical purpose, but it's a great endurance thing. When the rookies, Tim, Lance, and Troy, seem totally exhausted, then they start mock rescues. The workout seems to last forever. I figure it's only an hour and a half. We're not going to die. You can do anything for an hour and a half every day. You put your mind to it. That's what we've done. It's all mental. Yeah. After you go through something like this, like what we do, when it comes down to the real thing, make a rescue, you're totally confident in yourself. People sometimes think, you know, Baywatch, because they always see us running, they always see us swimming. It's nothing like it. No, it's no, nothing like it. Father, totally opposite. It's the real thing. Real lifeguards aren't the only ones who race on the sand here at Rehoboth. There are all sorts of beach games happening at all hours. Who are these people? Uh, we're the Yingling family, and we're having our, uh, what we call the Beach Olympics. We do this every year. Uh, we all get together, we all stay in one house, and uh, we have a great time for a week. It's not really important who wins, it's just really all about having fun. This is so well organized. Is it a city-run event? Uh, no, it's all put together by Aunt Donna. Okay, it's the chariot race. Aunt Donna may run these games, but the family's Rehoboth trips were started by her mother, Millie Yingling. Well, we've been coming here for um, oh, more than 40 years. We always stay in Rehoboth. We think it's 
It's not so big, but Rehoboth's more than just a traditional family beach. We took a walk with Henry Selevsky. We are headed down to um, Queen Street, which is where the gay beach of Rehoboth begins. Um, that's predominantly where most of the gay community goes to sunbathe, etc., etc. The gay beach is at the southern end of Rehoboth. It looks like any beach, except there's a higher percentage of men, and the bathing suits seem smaller and tighter than in the rest of Rehoboth. It's a family town, but not this section of the beach. <laughs> it's a beautiful beach. They take care of it. The people are wonderful here. It's one of those great places to be. Lance and Tim, those rookie lifeguards, are stationed here today. Lance grew up in Rehoboth and says the gay beach is just part of town. When I was younger, I think it was more of a big deal. Now it's, it's nothing. Everybody, I mean, we're all used to it. What do you do different at the beach that you wouldn't do at home? <laughs> I wear this. <laughs> <laughs> well, universal relaxation is a beach essential. And when you're on vacation in a relaxed town like Rehoboth, you might consider just staying here. And uh, I imagine in the winter it can be fairly uh, desolate. Um, but I would think it would be a nice place to live year-round. I'm thinking of it myself. <laughs> so why not move to the beach? Many people live and work near the shore. Others find ways to retire there. Cynthia Hope was a research chemist before she retired. And although she was raised in Ohio and lived for years in Connecticut, she's always had special affection for Cape Cod. I started coming in when I was three, and I think I've hardly missed a summer. Cape Cod is the name of this peninsula that sticks out of Massachusetts, sort of like an arm. What's odd is this area is known as the Upper Cape, and this part at the top is called the Lower Cape. The Lower Cape is because it's your lower arm, the lower part of your arm, and the upper part of your arm is where the Upper Cape is. Cynthia's house is on the Lower Cape, on a cove off Wellfleet Harbor. She probably inherited her love of Cape Cod from her father. He loved the Cape, and it was the only place he wanted to come to for a vacation. The real luck came to me when I found out I had inherited a little piece of land from my grandfather, and that's this piece here. And that's when I began to think about retiring here. Well, Cynthia has documented some of her family's love for Cape Cod on home movies. She took most of them in the 50s on one beach near Hyannis. Well, there's some that I remember very well of Sandy when she was about 18 months old and she was playing on the beach with, with her grandfather, my father, you know, and he was tickling her and she kept rolling back and kicking her feet up and giggling. And then there's another one where she's got my bathing cap and she's sitting there very studiously and she's digging in the sand and filling up this bathing cap with the sand as though it were a pail. And then the, there's one I remember that's not of the little children but of me and my contemporaries, my husband, myself, uh, my sister, my cousins, and a friend who were all here. We sometimes all came and we were playing baseball on the beach. It's another great one. I love looking at that, especially since one of them, my cousins, has just passed away. And we all look so young and healthy and full of life. You know. It means a lot uh, to all of us to have those movies. There's something about movies that's irreplaceable. I wouldn't have tried them for anything. Cynthia doesn't take a movie camera now when she goes to walk along the ocean. The name of this beach is McGuire's Landing. It's within the National Seashore that is owned by everybody in the United States, but it's managed by the town of Wellfleet. This is part of what's called the Great Beach. Thoreau walked the Great Beach from Chatham to Provincetown, and he called it the Great Beach. And in the summer, I'm really preoccupied in watching the people. I just love to watch the families and the children and the surroundings. 
surfers and the boogie boarders and um, just, you know, not thinking much about anything. Other times I'm just out for exercise. But it's more than just exercise. Even people who don't walk a lot know there's something special about walking at the ocean's edge. I think it's because when you look out on the water, it's it's endless. You know, just look out and there's all this great expanse of water and sky. It, uh, it has a very calming effect, I think. A lot of people don't even swim. You know, they're not even swimming, but they, they may just stand in the water or tossing the kids around or playing ball. They just like being in the water, even on a day that isn't that hot. And I've often thought, well, that's how we start out our lives, floating in the water before we're born, just playing around. Of course, there are some cool, gray, rainy days when you wouldn't want to be in the water around Cape Cod. Then you might drive into town to check out the local merchants. If you're here in Hyannis, maybe you'll wander down to the docks. Maybe you'll see a pickup truck full of really ugly sea creatures. <laughs> horseshoe crab. They're called horseshoe crabs, but technically they're not crabs at all. They're essentially living fossils. They haven't changed in over 200 million years. And scientists think they may be more closely related to spiders than to crabs. They live in the ocean, but come on shore to mate, and they can be entertaining as well as hideous. How do they catch them? Very carefully. <laughs> Step on their tail, they hurt you. They periodically molt out of these helmet-like shells, and the old carcasses often wash up along the east coast. You may find an empty old shell on the sand as you walk along the beach. <laughs> and the beach is where we all want to be, especially when the weather's sunny and warm. From this same waterfront in Hyannis, you can catch ferry boats on a regular schedule to some of the nearby islands. On the way out of the harbor, you can look to the right and see the Kennedy family compound. This boat is heading for Nantucket, which is this island just south of Cape Cod, just east of Martha's Vineyard. Why do people come to Nantucket? I looked at a map and I saw it was out in the water. It just looked like a really interesting place to come. I want to go out whale watching, and uh, so that's why I'm, I'm particularly watching out for how rough it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to visit friends who are spending the summer down there. activity along many parts of the coastline and around islands like this. Nantucket's history and prominence as a fishing and whaling center may add a certain excitement to any kind of boating in these waters, but it's not sailors or fishermen or whalers who come here today on the ferry. 
It's tourists. The boat leaves everybody in the town of Nantucket, and there's shopping and restaurants and touristy things to do there. But on a beautiful day, you may want to get right up to the beach. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to beautiful Nantucket, where you are on Surfside Beach, and it has beautiful waves, beautiful sands, and it is oh so very lovely here. It's one of those summer days when everyone's willing to be in the Chamber of Commerce. A perfect beach day. Waves are fabulous. They're awesome. They're huge. They're incredible. When you get on the top, you just feel like you're flying. It's so much fun. It's awesome. Most of the time we were digging and playing in the waves. Well, people come to the beach because they like, well, the salt has like a soothing manner, sort of, in the waves beneath you. And it sort of exhilarates you, starts your adrenaline. Some people just come to get a tan and look good. But some people actually like to swim and jump on the waves. Or some people surf or bodyboard. And it's just nice for you. I'm going to be here all week. I just think this is the greatest beach I've ever been to. In California, people are on parades. It's all style and flair. Here, I can be fat, and I don't, I'm don't. i not terribly embarrassed. It's a lot better. <laughs> on just about any beach, you can always show your style and flair in the sand castle you build. Here at Nantucket, two families from Albany, New York, the Grinies and the Behoviches, are working together on a big mound of sand. That's how we started. Everything else is just creation of the mind. Everyone is working independently. Work on whatever you want, more or less. We're staying here for two weeks at a house up there, and um, we'll come down here a lot. At the beach, there's seldom any schedule to daily comings and goings. Freedom from routine is a big attraction of the shore. But before the tide changes, you better be putting the finishing touches on today's sandcastle. Yeah, we're pretty much still because the water's getting to the gas now, so. so. It was the front entrance, but the water got over to it. There was a bridge and tunnels and houses and stuff. There's a G and a P, which stands for Grani and Pihovic, which are our last names. The beaches inspired people to build more than just sand castles. South of Atlantic City, at Margate, New Jersey, there's an unusual old building shaped like an elephant. Her name is Lucy. She was built in 1881 to attract real estate customers to this area. Over the years, she's become a landmark, still open to the public, thanks to the Save Lucy Committee. Its president, Josephine Heron, says this sort of structure is called an architectural folly. It's a wood building covered with what they call turn metal. And we, of course, have replaced the entire exterior. That's because Lucy is very old for a tourist attraction. The family who owned her for about 80 years tried several times to make her more useful, converting her for a short while into a tavern, among other things. After it was all restored, the former owner said he has her original tongue, which we have now on display, and then it waggled in the breeze, which I think is kind of silly, but... But you can still walk up into Lucy, sort of inside her belly. There's a small museum there. And the Save Lucy Committee expects to have this whole interior restored soon. And, of course, we have plans that people can get up close and look out the eyes, which are like portholes. Lucy the Margate Elephant is a national historic landmark and a big reminder to expect the unexpected at the beach. In San Diego, California, at the north end of Ocean Beach Park, the city has set aside a somewhat unexpected area where dogs can run free and play in the ocean. It's called Dog Beach. The Army Corps of Engineers put out this jetty in about 1956, I believe. This little area here has been all wandering off to Dog's Beach. Dogs and people. People and dogs. Dog's Beach? It's an excellent idea. We should have more. And the people here are so much cooler. This is Chelsea. And she loves to swim. She's one of the bestest doggers on Dog's Beach. I've lived here 25 years. And she's the best. That's why we come down to the beach. 
Everybody's having a wonderful time, the children, the puppies, and the grown dogs. It's a nice place for the dogs to cool down, and it's a nice way for me to meet other people, too. shops and then everybody comes down on Sundays and brings their dogs down. <laughs> My fearless cocker's pen. <laughs> of course, dogs have their own personalities and some even have beach wear. This dog isn't a real swimmer of a dog. He just sort of likes to hang out on the beach. But, but a lot of them go in the water and people throw balls in the water. It's, it's, a, it's a fun beach, but you have to watch where you step, of course. <laughs> of course. But you know, sometimes the simple, basic joys of the beach are the very best. In Hawaii, on Oahu, there's a beautiful beach called Kailua. It's been near the top of Dr. Leatherman's lists for many years, and local people like Vicky Milo know its basic charms. You can go fishing here, you can go sailing, you can go paddling, and you can go swimming. Besides letting out all your anxiety. <laughs> Vicky's nephew, Cam Timoteo, says the family comes here often. This is where we have everything at. We celebrate things here. We, we have parties here every, every year. Today, it's sort of a Timoteo family reunion. We're here celebrating my mom's birthday. My family's from the mainland, in San Francisco, um, New York, and from all around the island. We, we always do that to me. It's cool. We have to swim. We have a lot of fun. We get to meet different people and uh, we share what we have. Vicky's husband Milo is the chef today. What's cooking? Chicken. You see this is a fish, but in, in our culture we call it umi. For, for us local people, the reason why we come to the beach is it's like part of our heritage. It's where we feel more close with the ocean and the land. Yeah, it's where the food tastes better, fresher, and um, in, the, in the old ancient time where we come to the beach, not just for ceremonial purpose, but it's also like life, to breathe in new life into our system. Well, renewal is part of it, and relaxation, and being with people. And there are countless reasons why we all want to be near the ocean. And for many of us, the problem is, we're usually too far from all these shore things, and we wish we weren't. And then there's that last day of vacation, when you want to savor every moment, but you spend a lot of time plotting how to get back to the beach as soon as you can. Things was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. To order Sure Things on DVD or VHS, call WQED 